the whole opportunity in the preventative healthcare space seems to be different than the sick care sp space mm -hmm. and confusing those two and the business models around them and the motivations around them seems to be a, a, a common error in certain contexts. One is how do we overcome the barrier of health disparities that we have and health literacy? There's such a flood on the market already of mobile apps and health for the consumer. How the heck is somebody supposed to be able to differentiate the average consumer? I'm not sure it's fair to expect a patient as an individual to have to make that sort of decision. It's a big responsibility. Um, I'm not sure the best ways to get around that in terms of the market at the moment. Maybe there's something that needs to be done in the regulatory field, the accreditation aspect to it. But in terms of the uh, ways in which people are managing a flood and a front, uh, an amazing amount of content. They are using reliable intermediaries, and I think that's frankly one of the most interesting areas of innovation, which I haven't seen a huge amount of, um, but I think because it's that much more complicated, which is, you know something about me, and you know quite a lot about the market, can you actually give me some smart choices? There was an interesting point that came in from um, Ravi Bala around the shift in control that mobile health potentially has between the physician being in control and the patient being in control? I, th I think at the, at the patient side it's going to be a fundamental shift. On the, on, the, on the physician side it will go much, much slower. Most physicians would like to be involved in the decision making process mm -hmm. rather the insurance company or the third party administrator or the guy who picks up the bill. Instead of he telling the patient, look, you use mobile health, it would be much more pleasanter, much more acceptable acceptability on the part of the physician and the patient will be much higher. Here's the outcome we're trying to reach. What are the responsibilities and the tasks that can be done by the patient, either as a consumer, I really don't like the consumer, but as a patient or, uh, who's kind of very empowered, and then where is the uh, professional health caregiver fit into that equation? Do I inform you? Do I tell you which WebMD articles are the right ones to use versus JAMA? Or do I step out of the way and let you be empowered by your mobile device to track yourself. When you look at it through the aging perspective, what are the lessons that M Health has to learn from other areas that ought to be maybe brought on board? Just thinking about the average cost of putting somebody in a care home of seven thousand dollars a month, um, and thinking what simple changes you can make, which may be brokered by technology, may just be brokered by a smart architect and smart again systems thinking about what actually the requirements of somebody as they get older, or especially as they have a certain you know, specific step change in their, in their health, is going to be. And I think that's something that um, we're starting to see uh, a little bit of. And I think the, sort of the M Health component of that is really interesting because um, it combines much more than just health. It combines also the, sort of the lifestyle component. The differences between the developed and the developing world, and that people shouldn't try and mix those two. The whole challenge is around, as you articulated, the reimbursement system is very much biased towards sick care, not health care in the West. And yet, in many, part, many areas, people are looking at India and Africa and China as really the places with the greatest need and the greatest freedom to really move things forward. To a point that some people have a view that says actually in the next five years you're going to see more progress in the developing world than you are in the developed world. From a patient perspective, in terms of treatment seeking behaviour, there are similarities whether we're talking about a euro america centric model or um, you know, somewhere in Malawi or, or Mozambique or, or across into Asia. Um, I think there are similarities. I think there are a lot of differences. Um, I think we need to be aware of, of both of those as, as we move forward. But I think it's, personally, I think it's an incredibly exciting and really fascinating time to see, to see where this will, will go. I think some of the really interesting um, technology is inevitably going to be funded here. There's the, um, yeah, I think Qualcomm is, is co-funding this uh, tricorder prize, a $10 million prize for a mobile device that can diagnose as good as a panel of doctors, which I'm sure would be just to get your perspective on. Um, whether they, you know, whether there's a technology solution that does it, that'll probably come from, from big, deep-pocketed um, Western uh, markets. But I think in terms of the lack of constraints we've seen, the lack of infrastructure, they don't a lot of the time have the same 
you know, incentives um, with sort of misaligned between the payers in, in these countries, because it's much more private um, practice. So I think in terms of volume you're going to get in developing countries, and I think some of the technical innovations will be here, and I think an interesting thing will then be to, to, to cross between the two. So. The value propositions are, are so different, um, and I think the profile that you get right now in more of the developing countries is the pilots and the one-offs and the the, the, the standalone type of pilots. And, and in, the develop, in the developed countries, you're getting more of the connectivity mm. between the different offerings. We've obviously talked um, over the past um, hour or so about many different issues from the differences in different um, communities and, and, and different um, drivers of change. If we were to flip around and say, okay, if the human barriers were removed and five years' time everything's working, what does that look like? What does that feel like? It'll be fun. It'll be, uh, it'll be invisible. It'll be a, um, a way that I'm not even realizing I'm being monitored in a way that is good for me. It's not the Big Brother monitor. It's I'm able to, to take control. I'm going to have much more subtle, much more implicit guidance to uh, influence my behavior um, well before I even start to get ill and sick. I think where I see this as being very exciting is that it's an enabling technology. We're going to be giving um, access to healthcare to individuals and communities who previously have never had the luxury of healthcare. So any, any views you have contrary or additional to what's being discussed, please don't hold back. The idea of sharing this and making it the conversation as open and as rich as possible is clearly um, behind the philosophy here. So thank you again for, for your participation.